Happy birthday, Bob. And particularly the 80th birthday is a very special milestone. And I really appreciated the invitation from Brian Toby to uh, say a few words on this special occasion. Uh, unfortunately, I'm going to be in India celebrating CNR Rao's 90th birthday on the 4th of December. And so I've recorded uh, this short presentation uh, in Santa Barbara on the 24th of October. And uh, so people may not realize, of course, that you and I, Bob, have known each other for more than 50 years. Yeah. If I remember correctly, you came to Oxford uh, from the States in uh, 1972, and you already had a faculty position at uh, Arizona State University, having done your PhD at Cornell, but ASU very uh, generously gave you a leave of absence so that you could take up an NSF uh, international fellowship that enabled you to spend two years in Oxford. And that was a wonderful uh, coincidence from my point of view, because I was just starting a postdoctoral fellowship uh, in Oxford itself. And so we quickly got to know each other when you arrived in probably October of 1972. Um, at the time, I had a background in powder diffraction from my PhD. And I'll show you here the kinds of things that we were doing. Um, you know, before the Rietveld method came along, powder diffraction was a poor man's tool. And you can see what I've been doing in my PhD here, uh, taking integrated intensities from a powder pattern. Uh, this is a neutron powder pattern of a calcium fluoride dope with YF3, and then analyzing the integrated intensities. And then in 1969, uh, Rietveld published his seminal paper. And uh, when I read that paper, I realized that this was going to have a profound effect um, on the utility of powder diffraction. And by good fortune, um, Alan Hewitt, who was at Harwell at the time, where I spent most of my life in those days, Alan had gone to the Netherlands and brought back the code from Petten. Uh, the Rietveld code, which was written in some obscure Dutch Algol computer language. And Alan got the code running at Harwell, and I was able to have access to it in the uh, very early 70s and started to play around with it. It was my good fortune that when you arrived in Oxford, um, even though you were not a powder diffraction specialist, you had both an excellent background in single crystal diffraction, and you also were already at that point outstandingly good at programming and uh, enabling the complex Rietveld code uh, to get running on the university's computer in Oxford. You remember it was an ICL 1900 computer and it was the bane of everybody's life. But with my encouragement and, and your uh, expertise, uh, you got the Rietveld code up and running probably by the um, end of 1972 or early 1973. I think both of us realized at that point that the Rietveld method was going to have a fantastic impact and that what had been done in the Netherlands didn't stretch it uh, to the point that it could be stretched in terms of the complexity of structures that one could analyze. And so we selected, once the program was running, we selected the structures of two compounds, which were very popular at that time. They were titanium niobium oxides, TiMb207 and Ti2Mb10029. And we selected these because there were single crystal structures, which were already known. And those were done by David Wadsley in 1961. And he had assumed that the titanium and niobium were randomly distributed in the block structures. And you and I thought that that was unlikely. And because neutrons are so exquisitely sensitive to the distribution of titanium and niobium across the different metal sites, um, we chose those two compounds as our vehicle to demonstrate the power of the Rietveld method. 
And that's uh, led in due course to a paper in, in uh, Nature in 1973 and then a full paper in Prop Roy Sock in 1974, where we showed that in fact there was very considerable um, segregation of titanium and niobium into the different uh, cation sites uh, in the block structure of these compounds and ranging in one case from about 3% titanium to about 60% titanium. And uh, in the case of TIMB207, there were five metal sites and in this TI2MB10029, there were six. This was so complex compared with anything that anybody else had done that when I went to Australia to a conference in the summer of 1973 and presented the results, people didn't believe it. The single crystal people did not believe that you could do a structure of this complexity. And uh, it took quite a few years before people started to uh, accept that it was indeed um, correct and that you could tackle problems of this type. Um, we also, you might remember, did some electron microscopy on it. I just show this to remind everybody what high resolution TEM was like in the early 70s. This went into our Nature paper and I think to the Procroy Sock paper and it shows that even though TEM was quite primitive then, that you could actually resolve the, uh, the shear planes in these block structures um, with the sort of darker outlines. You can see the, the sort of rectangular blocks in the structure. So little did we know in the early 70s that these two compounds were going to become extremely important later on uh, in our lives. And um, fast forward 50 years, these titanium niobium oxides have attracted a huge amount of attention uh, because they will undergo lithium insertion um, with, uh, very rapidly. And so they make excellent anodes for lithium ion batteries. There are lots of different cathodes, but there aren't lots of different anodes. And, and most of the anodes that people use in LIBs are just carbons. And so this particular material um, is on the verge of being commercialized now as, as a fast charging um, lithium ion battery anode. And it's interesting, the anatomy of this discovery, because this material had been known since the 50s, People at um, Battelle Laboratories and NIST were looking at it for the nuclear industry as a, a ceramic for nuclear reactors. Then the crystal structure was done in the 60s, as I mentioned, by Wadsley. You and I did the work on the uh, neutron diffraction, showing that the cation distribution was quite complex. And then Another decade on, Bob Carver and his colleagues at Bell Labs showed that you could insert lithium into it. By then, the lithium ion battery was on people's radar screen, but it wasn't until 2011 that John Goodenough, who'd been a colleague at Oxford, of course, but then uh, moved to Austin, that John demonstrated that you could make uh, a battery using TIMB207 as the anode and uh, noticed that it had this enormous advantage of charging very rapidly. And so then, fast forward another decade, um, it's being commercialized by Toshiba and a Brazilian mining company who are enabling the um, access to the required quantities of niobium, um, presumably at a decent price, in order to facil facilitate this new application. And, Ramsa Shadri and Fred Woodle and I wrote an article about the anatomy of materials discovery and this is a wonderful example how the original intention when it was discovered was nothing to do with lithium ion batteries which had not been discovered at that point but it was all to do with the nuclear industry and then gradually uh, people recognised as the need for new electrodes for LIBs came along uh, that this was a wonderful candidate. So this is a slide just summarising that history and you'll remember that uh, we published this with Kent Griffith with some of the 
um, old people who'd worked on it, dear John Goodenough, the late John Goodenough, and uh, Claire Gray, who worked on it much later, Bob Carver, myself, and you, um, amongst others, getting together to tell the history um, in the chemistry of materials. Now, that was in the early 70s, and, and you stayed in Oxford for a couple of years, and we had a lot of fun in Oxford. It was such a joy to work with you, and you and I were sort of completely complementary. I think I was good at the things that you were not so good at, and you were particularly good at the things I, that I was terrible at, like uh, programming and so on. But together we made a powerful team. And so after I joined the faculty in 1974 at Oxford, and you remember, which is another story, that you were also a candidate for that job, but I think I'll let you tell uh, your audience about that when we got drunk at the dinner after the interviews and so on. But in the end, I got the job and you returned to Arizona and joined the faculty um, at ASU, where you spent many years. During the late 70s, in 1977, I actually came to Arizona as a Fulbright scholar and spent sabbatical leave with you. And we taught a course together. We had some wonderful times. I can remember driving over to Los Alamos um, in your old Ford Pinto with a Dewar in the back of your car. And in the Dewar, we had a, a sort of liquid ammonia with a metal uh, that have been dissolved in it. So we are looking at these um, metal amine complexes in liquid ammonia. And it kept popping in the back of the car. And anyway, when we got to Los Alamos after about a 10 hour drive, it was such a, a, a lovely evening that we just left the car in the car park at the golf club and went and played a round of golf with uh, a couple of colleagues from Los Alamos. That's one of many happy memories from the sabbatical leave in, in uh, 77. And uh, of course, for a period, we then went on our different ways and uh, didn't interact as much as our careers took off in different directions. I just wanted to highlight some of the wonderful things that Bob has done during his career. And there are just so many uh, facets to it, so I don't have time uh, to talk about everything. But I wonder if you remember, Bob, I'm sure you will, that we did quite a few winter schools um, in the early 90s, like 1992, 1994, uh, after I'd moved to California and uh, I remember we went to South America, and these are schools that we did with Ray Young from Georgia Tech. And we did a school in uh, Argentina in La Plata. We did another school in Rio. And then we did a couple of schools in uh, Cheshire in Poland at the Silesian University. Um, and these are Rietveld schools. And they were great fun. I, I can remember uh, you and I, of course, have were pretty well rehearsed and we had well-organised lectures. Um, the late Ray Young, who was wonderful, was not quite so well-organised and not quite so predictable. I rem remember we asked him to give the opening lecture uh, in Poland at the first school that we did there. And I was supposed to be giving the second lecture, but I was not very well-organised for it. And Ray suddenly dried up after about 20 minutes and stopped. And so I had to suddenly pick it up and, um, and uh, fill in and get on with my own talk, which was um, a bit premature for me. But those were wonderful things, but they're very important for students as well. And they r recruited students from South America and from Poland, Russia and so on. One of the students from Poland came, uh, did a PhD with me, Victor Morawiecki, came to Santa Barbara and then settled in the USA. I remember another student who'd gone to the one in Argentina wrote to me for several years afterwards asking me questions and so on. And just turning on some of the other things, wonderful things that Bob's done, uh, 
Of course, everybody associates, associates him with the GSAS code, which has had uh, a massive impact. And what I wanted to emphasize about that was uh, not only just the sustained commitment to it over several decades, since it's still evolving and so on, but the way in which Bob's work with the Rietveld method enabled success for other people. And this, um, you know, it's a characteristic of, of you, Bob, that you, you don't do things just for yourself. You're, you're doing it to enable other people's success. And the GSAS code has been a phenomenal example of that. Um, amongst the various things that you incorporated into it was uh, doing strain and texture analysis from Rietveld refinement, which was uh, which you did a lot of work on in the 1990s, um, and also using uh, the Rietveld method to uh, study high pressure properties of both minerals and um, inorganic materials again in in the 1990s. I was going to mention one other thing that struck me, which was this. Uh, protein structure from synchrotron powder x-ray diffraction. This was a kind of outrageous development. If I just go forward one slide, this shows your uh, Rietveld refinement of, um, I think this is, uh, it's turkey egg white lysozyme. And just this phenomenal fit that enabled you to refine the structure you know, with appropriate constraints on the amino acids and so on. And I remember that when we were at Oxford, we had thought about doing this with powder diffraction, but this was before the synchron was available. And we tried it with neutron diffraction. And of course, with all the hydrogen and water at the side of the thing, it was a complete disaster and went nowhere. But I was super impressed when uh, many years later that you show that it really could be done and that um, powder diffraction had become so powerful that you could refine structures, you could even solve structures um, a priori uh, using synchrotron data from proteins. And then the other thing I just wanted to mention which struck me just a couple of years ago. This was published in 2020, and I think you sent me a copy of it when we were in discussion about the TIMB 207 article with Kent Griffith, showing that you could actually collect a powder pattern of a material in 100 picoseconds from a single pulse of x-rays. And this is just a kind of extraordinary demonstration of the power of diffraction methods and power of powder diffraction methods in which you be a pioneer. So on that point I just draw to a close. I'm really sorry I can't be there Bob. I certainly wish I was. I'm sure you'll have a wonderful day with many old friends. Um, I don't know who's going to be there for sure. I know that Brian will be there so thank you for inviting me Brian and um, hopefully there'll be other people who remember me and I send my best wishes to them but especially to you Bob on this wonderful occasion. Thank you.